This video starts with section three, which is page 289, goes to 296, um, and on 296 we end at before trap one superiority. Section three, sustaining success. High performance killers, beware three traps. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. William Shakespeare, Julius Caesar. Beware superior, see, superiority. Beware dissatisfaction. Beware neglect. That's him over there, Andrea tells me. Dreadful Don. I look across the bar to where the well-dressed executive Andre is pointing to. Why do you call him that? Andrea furrows his brow. We all call him that. They called him that long before I got here. He's the VP of sales. Miserable to work with. Everyone hates him. But I thought you said he's the star performer in your company. For the moment, yes. He's successful, but a total jerk. This party tonight is happening only because he crushed it so hard the whole sales team made its numbers two months early. When you talk to him tomorrow, I'm sure he'll be delighted to tell you how awesome he is. I'm surprised to hear Andre talk like this. He's a very centered, solid, likable CFO of a manufacturing company. I coached him at another company for years, never, never heard him speak ill of anyone. He's been at this new job for just six months, and it's hard to imagine that someone has gotten under his skin so quickly. Something isn't computing. I see Don surrounded by his co-workers, and they all seem to be having a good time. I don't get it, I say to Andre. If he's a total jerk as you say, then how does he keep getting ahead? Won't people stop supporting him at some point, and then he'll crash and burn? Andre takes a sip of his single malt and laughs. Oh, they already have. He just doesn't know it yet. The next morning, Andre brings me into the company headquarters. He's getting paid twice what he did at his old job, but as we enter the building, I can sense he isn't happy to be here. You'll see why today, he tells me. We walk into the conference room where Don is checking his PowerPoint. Today, he's leading the quarterly sales meeting where he sets the tone and path to make the company's goals. His ent entire sales team of 144 people is here. The C unit who Andre has brought me into coach is also here. CEO, CTO, COM. I've worked with them all for just a few weeks and all of them asked me to work with Don. They've arranged for me to meet with him after his presentation and assess whether I can help. I watched Don give what many would consider a stellar 90 minute presentation. He's strategic, organized, and articulate. He has that sort of forward lean and swagger that makes you want to go change into the charge into the battlefield with him. After the presentation, I meet with Don privately. Ask, how did you think your talk went? It was good enough. You never really satisfy with the speech, you know. You always think of something else you could tell them. Yeah, I know the feeling. How do you think the audience received it? Most of it probably went over their heads, but it's just a meeting. It's my job to stay on top of them and really push them to execute from here. It takes a lot of follow-up. You know how it is. It seemed pretty straightforward to me, I say. You think it went over their heads? Hey, man, you know, it's literally at the top, so you just hope you can explain your point of view well. Lonely at the top? You know what I mean. Not everyone gets us, you know? The best? I'm sure you've learned that working with so many winners... Maybe you can help me turn these guys into champions. They just don't get it, you know? I say nothing and just wait for him to share more. He looks at me quizzically. You do know what I mean, right? You know? I debate whether we have enough of a relationship that I can tell him the truth. He doesn't know that his attitude and the phrase lonely at the top are reliable omens for every great downfall I've ever seen. Hey, man, you can tell me what you're thinking. Say it straight. I don't have a lot of time today. I can handle you, I promise, he says, laughing. Nothing you say will hurt my feelings. Promise. Okay, good. 
I think you have six months tops before you destroy your career. This chapter is about failure, but not just any kind of failure. It's about the calamitous fall from grace that high performers can experience when they get so good that they forget what made them successful. This chapter is an effect that anti-practices of high performers. It's about how people like Dawn start thinking they're separate from others, better than others, more capable than others, and more important than others, and how those attitudes destroy performance and careers. It's also about the problems that come from the never-be-satisfied, hustle-and-grind approach that sucks passion and leads to overcommitment. This is a chapter about the warning signs, the thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that knock high performers out of the sky. Dun-dun-dun! Long before I met Dawn, I had survived high performers about... I surveyed... He didn't survive, sorry. I surveyed high performers about what brought an end to previous winning streaks. I surveyed 500 people who had scored in the top 15% looking for clues. I want to know how long they felt they had sustained their success, whether they had ever fallen hard, and whether they ever felt they had risen to such heights again. I asked them open-ended questions such as, when was, the time, when was the time you had an initial period of success? Say, three to five years, then suddenly failed. Ask more questions to find out what caused them to fail, how long they went down, how fast they achieved success again, and what factors led to the bounce back. The stories were astonishingly similar to those I had heard working with high performers from all walks of life. I collected the 500 surveys and stories, then did another 20 interviews to learn more. Then I compared all those findings to my own experiences coaching high performers over the past 10 years. Obviously, patterns emerged. 1. When high performers fell from grace, the most frequent culprits, aside from falling, failing to practice the habits you've learned in this book, came down to three things. 1. Is not a point. Everything else is a point, by the way. So here we go. Two, when high performers rose back, the habits in this book were the vehicles for that ascension. Three, when high performers describe such an up and down journey, they clearly never want to make the same mistakes again. The fall was, pa was that painful. When you fail at the beginning of a journey, it's frustrating. When you fail hard after making it for so many years, it feels immeasurably worse. So what were the three things that caused high performers to fall out of prolonged success? Let's start with what didn't cause them to fail. Fear was not the issue. To become high performers, people have learned to get comfortable with the uncomfortable. The people I surveyed didn't report failing because of worry, fear, or holding back. Confidence was not an issue. To succeed in the first place, you have to be good at your craft, no one said. Gosh, Brendan, I just wasn't skilled enough to stay on top. Other people were not the issue. Of 500 people who responded to my survey, only seven blamed other people for their stumbles. But even in those cases, the respondents ultimately reasoned that it was their own fault. High performers, especially those who have fallen down and got back up, take personal responsibility for their journey. Creativity was not the issue. I'd expected some high performers to say they were passed up because they ran out of good ideas. That didn't happen. Motivation was not the issue. If anything, these high performers were deeply, if not desperately, motivated to climb back up. You could say they had extreme performance necessity. Resources were not the issue. Only 38 of 500 people blamed money or insufficient support as the reasons they failed. I spoke with 14 of those 38, and certainly lack of money or support, was a ready excuse. But behind that excuse, they accepted a colder, harder truth. They messed up. These issues could certainly be fair and understandably, understandable reasons for people to fail. But what I learned from high performers is that these just aren't the real failure points of sustained performance. The real traps are internal negative patterns of thinking, feeling, and and behaving that slowly kill out humanity, zest, and well-being. The traps are superiority, dissatisfaction, and neglect. 
If you're going to maintain high performance, you need to maintain your high performance habits and avoid these three traps. Dun dun dun. To be continued with number one, superiority 